Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming today. We have some fun. Um, I particularly like this topic because it takes everything we learned last time, which was more than nuts and bolts, and let's just actually do something really fun with it. So I think you're going to have a good time. So why don't we get started? First, um, I'm going to share my screen, make sure we've got all that working. Hopefully everybody can see my screen right now. Okay. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, today, well, let's, let me recap. Last time was <coughs> using GWT and PhoneGap. GWT is uh, short for the Google Web Toolkit. It's essentially a compiler and a set of libraries which lets you write in Java code and it compiles to optimized JavaScript. HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, so you can load it up in a web browser. But then PhoneGap is a set of scripts which will take web stuff, HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, and turn that into a native app for various mobile platforms such as iOS and, and WebOS and Android. Now, uh, that's what we learned about last time. This time we're going to use a new API that's available in GDPT called Canvas and a third-party library called Box2D. And with those two, we're going to create a video game. Uh, it'll be a kind of simple video game, but enough to get you started, and you can see how you'll be able to build on this and create a real game that you could actually um, distribute or even sell in the various app stores. So why don't we get started here? Now, GWT starts with um, an entry point. So you create a class, and it has to implement the entry point interface, which is simply this single uh, method on mo module load. Now, Canvas is actually an HTML tag which GDBT is wrapping. It's a part of HTML5, and essentially it's a drawing area. It gives you a rectangular area on the screen, and you can draw pixels into it, and you can draw shapes, but they're still pixels. It's not like SVG where it's vector-based. Canvas is very much about pixels. Um, if we can draw polygons, we can draw rectangles and circles, we can draw images, we can draw gradients, um, patterns, pretty much anything you can think of, we can draw on Canvas. Uh, there's even people who've done some 3D work with it using uh, some third-party libraries. So today's application we're going to do just entirely in 2D. So Canvas has been around for a while, and in recent versions of desktop browsers and even some mobile browsers, it's becoming hardware accelerated, which means that it's fast enough we can actually do real-time video games with it, meaning at least 30 frames per second. Now Canvas is pretty simple. You just get a context and you set some properties and then you draw to it. There we go. Um, yes, we will have some source code, and in fact this what we're talking about in this um, in today's session is actually in the book that's coming out soon. So this is in fact the final project, though I'm not going to go as in depth as it is in the book. And the source for the entire project will be available online as well. So getting back to Canvas. So I'm going to create a Canvas debug draw object. Now this is imported from com Google GWT Canvas client by Canvas. Anything that's com Google GWT means that it's built into GWT as opposed to a third-party library, such as this uh, JBox Duty that we'll get to later. And the Canvas is just a rectangular area, so I'm going to give it a size. The bug draw um, 1024 by 700. I chose that because that will fit in landscape mode on most uh, tablet computers, like the iPad. Then we're going to get a reference to the actual canvas from it. Canvas debug draw is essentially a wrapper around the real canvas. So let's get a reference to the real canvas, then add it to the screen with get root layout panel, excuse me, root layout panel, get add canvas, and this will make it fill the entire web page. Once canvas is installed, we can get a context 2D, and this is what you actually draw on. It's the real rendering surface. 
fill cell to black. Now we can fill a rectangle. I'm going to fill the entire screen with black. So 0, 0 to canvas draw width, canvas draw height. Then set the fill to red and begin a path. Now it's important to understand, Canvas is fundamentally about pixels, so it doesn't actually support many shapes. It has a direct fill and draw rectangle method, and it has paths. Paths are compound Bezier paths, meaning it's a whole bunch of lines and curves all stuck together. But it doesn't have, say, circles. If you want to use circles, you have to create a path, which is a circle. If you wanted a rounded rectangle, you'd have to create a path with the shape of a rounded rectangle. In this case, we're going to just create a simple triangle. So I'm going to move to 300 by 300, then do a couple of lines, and then close it, and then fill it. And that's all there is to it. Now, um, since this is GWT, I've created my class, which is the entry point, and then I'm going to go to my GWT XML, make sure it's setting the entry point properly, which it is. Now, Let's build it on the command line. Now, GWT also has an interactive mode, which is what I used last time. I tend not to use the interactive mode with Canvas because whenever we're doing something that's animated 30 times a second, all of that information has to go over the wire from the developer tool into the browser. And I have found it just to be really, really slow. So slow that I couldn't really use it for interactive testing. So rather than using the developer mode, I'm just going to compile it and run it normally. So here we go. And we have a bug. What's going on here? Oops. Get rid of There we go. Now we can see it filled the screen with black. And if I resize fully, you can see this is actually the edge of the canvas. And I just filled it in with a red rectangle. There we go, pretty simple and basic, but we can at least get something up on the screen, so that's good. Now, let's flip back to the code. So let's add a circle. Let's do that set fill style. Actually, instead of circle, let's uh, draw another rectangle, but this time we're going to stroke it. So I want to uh, color it with green, and this could be a hex uh, value as well, so I could do um, 0, 0, FF, 0, 0. These, by the way, um, since this is a direct wrapper of Canvas, you can actually look up the API docs for the real HTML Canvas and uh, find out everything that's going to be there. So let's um, set the fill style, x dot fill rect. Now, one nice thing about doing this with GWT is we have Java code, so we get all the nice code completions. Uh, so let's fill a rectangle. Let's do um, 100 by 100 by 100 by 100. And now I want to also set the stroke style to, let's see, let's make that be white. White dot stroke rectangle. And I want to have a really fat border, so set stroke, um, set line width, make it 15. Now come back, recompile. And as soon as that is done, you notice it does take a little bit of time to compile, but it's not as long as it would be if I was doing the full GWT compile. What I've done, since I'm testing in Chrome, I know that I only need the WebKit versions. GWT actually compiles your code for every possible web platform. So it's doing special code builds for Safari, for Chrome, for Firefox, for Internet Explorer, for mobile versions. Um, I only care about compiling one version, at least right now while I'm um, doing testing. So in my XML, I set this that user agent is Safari. Then it will only do one of the compilation paths. And then I'll turn that off before I go into production. There we go. Here's our green rectangle, and it's got a nice, flat, white border. So 
Um, Canvas is actually pretty simple if you've done any work with um, Java 2D and Swing, then it should be very familiar. So I won't go too much into Canvas itself. Um, it does give you rectangles, shapes, uh, in the form of paths. It gives you text and images, uh, gradients, patterns, um, and patterns are just uh, fills with images. It also has a couple of basic effects like uh, shadow blur. Um, and with those things, you can make pretty much anything you want. Now, what I've shown you so far, it's just plain drawing. It's not actually animation. Canvas doesn't directly support animation. What you have to do is redraw a canvas over and over again with a timer. Um, and in order to do that nicely, there's a few tricky things you have to do. So before we get to animation, we're going to talk about physics, because physics will actually handle some of the animation for us. Now, when we make a video game, we often need physics. What I mean by physics is something which will calculate where all the objects are on the screen and how they interact with each other. So it needs to know about gravity, it needs to know who the player is, it needs to know who the ground is, who the enemies are, where they are, and detect if they hit each other, detect how fast things should move, and even do simple particle physics like if one thing hits another thing, then it should bounce off. And how it bounces off and how it's affected by gravity depends on the mass of the object, how springy it is, what the source of friction is in the world, all of the things that you would learn in basic particle dynamics. Now, um, doing this on your own could take quite a while, especially if you wanted to make it accurate. And even if you don't want it accurate, just making something that feels right and is performant could take a lot of time. Fortunately, there's a fantastic open source library called Box2D. Box2D is really amazing. I love it. Box2D is uh, it's actually a C-based library, which was created, um, I want to say, about five or six years ago, maybe a little longer. And it's been used in a ton of video games that you've heard of, including Angry Birds. Box2D was then ported to ActionScript. And then that port was ported to JavaScript. And then someone has created a GWT wrapper for Box2D, which is this um, JBox2D that we talked about, that I mentioned earlier. Now, Box2D handles all of these annoying details for you. It handles gravity. It handles uh, having different objects on the screen. It knows which ones move and which ones are static. It knows the mass and weight of everything. Um, and it, while it's not the easiest to use API, it really handles so much for you that I highly recommend using it. And there's lots of tutorials on it because it is so commonly used in video games. Now, the API is identical to the C version, so those tutorials will continue to work whether, regardless of which language you're coding in. However, the API is a little weird coming from the Java world because it was written originally for C, and so it does things in the somewhat non-object oriented way. Um, I am, yes, Mina, I am, where are the chat rooms? I'm not seeing everything. I see a couple of QA questions, but I don't see a uh, general chat from all the attendees. Okay, let, let's take a look here. Do you have your group chat open? It's that up at the top there. Do. Yeah, under oh, view. Oh, not a button. Okay. And it will pop up in, in that other window. Yeah. So we've got all the dialogue there, and um, we've got people already asking great questions. We're populating that in the QA for you. And while I'm on the phone, I'll just let folks know, folks, if you do have questions for Josh and what he's showing you, please open your group chat, type your question in there, and later for Q&A, Josh will answer them. Back to you, Josh. Thanks. So um, let's start making a little world. First thing you're going to do is create a world object and give it some gravity. In this case, uh, box 2 is roughly based on real physics uh, on Earth on this Etsy level. And it's good for things that are between uh, about a foot high and maybe 10 meters. So if you create uh, a vector gravity that's negative 10 F, meaning um, negative 
10 units uh, per second squared, then one unit is going to be roughly a foot, so, or uh, roughly a meter, so about 10 meters per second squared. So anything you draw should be, when you're modeling your world, should be roughly in that uh, frame. And if you need to go outside of that, you should scale down your model rather than giving box to the giant sizes like, you know, 10,000, because um, a lot of the equations start getting wonky when you get out of that range. So let's create the world. Now I'm going to do something a little magic here. I'm going to call set the bug draw with our canvas draw. What that means is, this is our canvas, and I'm going to tell the world that I want it to draw into that canvas. Now, once the game is in production, I would be doing all the drawing on my own. But just so we can see the physics, we're going to start by using debug draw. It's a very nifty feature. Uh, set the camera, and this is just X, Y, and Z, meaning uh, where it is in the world and roughly how far away or how wide the camera is. Uh, generally, you just leave these defaults and only tweak them later if you really need to. Now let's create something in the bottom of our world, a floor. And here we're going to get into a couple of, of the box 2D terms. We start with a body, or rather a body definition, or body def for short. And that means this is a definition of a body. The definitions are like templates. You can think of them as factories where you initialize a template and then you create an instance of something and then you can reuse that template or throw it away. So any of these body desks, or think of them as static that you can reuse and throw away. So I'm going to create a new body, give it a position at 0, 0, and then I'm going to pass it to the world to actually create my body and call it ground. Now a body is just an object on the screen, it doesn't actually have a shape yet, let's give it a shape. So I'm going to create a new polygon shape, which is a uh, shape definition. I'm going to make it be a box, which is 10 units wide one unit high. Uh, it has a position at zero, zero, and a rotation of zero. Now I'm going to create a fixture. A f body is just an object. A fixture is the shapes which make up that object. So if I have just a box, then that's going to be a single body, like say a crate, uh, which has one fixture on it, which is the actual outline of the crate, the box itself. Uh, now the, the weight, the, the bodies and the fixtures are separate concepts in box 2D because a body could have multiple fixtures. Say you have uh, like a, maybe a swing set, you know, that would actually be a bunch of different objects but it's all, or a bunch of different shapes but it would all be part of one concrete object which is the actual body. So for now, just know that we need both a body which contains a fixture. So I'm going to call create fixture with my shape definition, this polygon, um, give it a, an additional position, uh, initial angle zero, and I create it for the ground. Now, I don't need to mess with the fixture after this, so I didn't save a reference to the created fixture. It's just part of the ground. Now let's make a circle. So the ground is the thing that's just the ground. It's static in the world. Circle is something I want to put up in the sky and actually have it fall, so it's dynamic. Now I'm going to reuse the body death object here, but give it a new position, and I want to change its type to dynamic. By default, anything in the world is static, which means Box2D will skip it when doing um, some of the physics calculations. And this is more of an efficiency thing than anything else. The body type that's dynamic is something that will actually move around and requires more calculations. So I'm going to set the type to dynamic. Now again, I'm going to create a body, in this case it's my circle. Now it also needs a fixture, it needs a shape. I want a circle shape, so let's create a circle shape, give it a radius of 3, and create that fixture at a position, um, angle of 1, excuse me, a um, mass of 1. Generally, um, anything that's static, you can just leave it zero, and for anything that's dynamic, give it a mass of one, and tweak those values later. So now we have the ground, and we've got a circle. Now to actually make it draw on screen, we have to not only draw, but draw it every single time. What we need is a loop. Now this is fundamental to pretty much any game, is there's a game loop. The game loop, is you process some input, if there's any, then you calculate the position of everything in the world, and then you draw it, and then you loop over that over and over again. 
Now GWT has a nice timer object, so create one of those. And I want to schedule it to be repeating uh, 30 frames a second, which is, uh, this is in terms of milliseconds, so I'm going to say 1,000 divided by 30, which is like 33 milliseconds, I think. And that's going to call the run method um, 30 frames a second. So inside there, I'm going to invoke step and render, and I'll show you these below. Uh, I don't, now, if there was input, I'd probably do something like process input, but we don't have input yet here. So we'll leave that out for now. So it's called step. Now what step does is it actually invokes the step function on the world. So the world object, which is the root of our whole world of things, it will execute the actual physics. And we just need to tell it when to do so. So I created a time step, 1 divided by 30, meaning a 30th of a second, and um, set warm storming starting true. This is, again, mainly efficiency, so leave that as a default, and leave continuous physics as a default. Um, the, uh, these are relatively esoteric things that you will need to mess with most of the time. That will call step, give it the time step, and 4 and 3. And start with 4 and 3, but these are variables that you can adjust to say how accurate you want the world calculations to be. And that lets you basically trade off accuracy versus performance. Not as much of an issue on desktop, but on mobile, you'll want to mess with these numbers to get better efficiency. For now, just leave those 4 and 3. So that's the step, and that will tell the world to do all the calculations. And now we can draw render. So every time it's a loop, it calls step and then render. Render will just clear the screen. It's going to set some magic flags and then calls data. Now rather than drawing our own stuff, we're having the world draw it for us. This is a really easy way of just getting your stuff up and running and see what it looks like. And these flags control what stuff it should draw. So I want it to draw the shapes that you actually see on the screen and the joints. And I'll get to joints in a second. So that's it for a basic world. We've got the world itself, we've got a static floor, circle that will fall, and then our simple game loop. So let's go over here to the XML switch. We want to use uh, Blob2, recompile it, load up our browser, and let's see what it looks like. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. Usually it's about 20 seconds, but oh, there we go. Okay. And there we go. There's our simple world. Here's our floor. This is our circle. Hit reload. We see that it falls, and it just stops when it actually hits the floor. I didn't have to calculate how fast it fell. I didn't have to calculate when it actually hits the, the rectangle. The physics simulation does that for me. Of course, it doesn't do very much, it's not very interesting, it doesn't look very good, but it's a good start. Now, let's try designing a real game. Now, for the book, I decided I wanted to create a game that would actually work on a tablet, and rather than having buttons like a, a platform or, say, Mario, I wanted something that would feel natural on a tablet device. So I chose to use the accelerometer. And that made me think of, what would you do with an accelerometer? Um, you know, maybe have like some water or oil that would flash back and forth as you tilt it. So that brought me the idea of this little blob character. And I want the blob guy to slosh back and forth as you tilt the screen. And that's how you would actually navigate around the world. Now, this will be a platformer, so there's, you know, levels that have uh, walls and platforms and things that you have to jump up and down. But you do it all by tilting the screen. So I'm going to show you what the game looks like really quick. Then let's load up the code. As you can see, the code is significantly larger, but it's still built on the exact same stuff I showed you before. Um, oh, that 
Ellen. in the last chapter of the book, Blob Hope in the Road to Splitsville. And if we just tap, then you can see here's my little Blob character. He's kind of wobbling a little bit. And this is the world with all these little platforms. If I click over here, he's going to try to move in the direction of the click. As you can see, when he hits the wall and stuff, it's this nice blobby shape that kind of wobbles and jiggles around. It's very fun to play with. And then, of course, I added some googly eyes you know, to make him look really cute. And what I'm actually doing here when I click is I'm changing the direction of gravity. Um, and on the real game, if I was running on the tablet, instead of clicking, I would be tilting to change the direction of gravity. So that's what the little game looks like. Gives you an idea of what we're going for. So back to our code. Now we're going to start through the same process. Um, first, I'm going to skip this stuff right here. This is how we actually attach the accelerometer and get um, tilt values. Skip that for now. So again, we created our debug draw for the canvas. Um, was at, I added a couple of event handlers so that I can show the splash screen, and then when you tap on it, it makes the screen go away. And if you win the game, uh, you can tap to restart the game. So that's standard GWT stuff. Here, I set the camera just like before, set gravity like before, attached to the world for drawing. Now we're going to create the ground. And before the ground was a single box, meaning a body with a single fixture that was box shaped. This one, I'm going to create a bunch of boxes to give us the different parts of the world, all the different levels. So um, let's start by, here's my body definition, give the position, create it. Now we're going to make the bottom edge. And this is the first platform that was right underneath the Bob guy. So call set as box. Uh, this gives us um, width and height. This gives us a position. And this gives us an angle. And create the fixture. Again, I set the, the mass to zero because it's not moving. It's essentially infinite mass. Uh, then the top edge is the same thing. And I notice I'm just reusing SD each time and then creating a new fixture. So go through, this creates all the different vertical and horizontal parts. Now there is one that was that angle. Let's bring that up again. Where, you go this way, you see there's this one that's at an angle like that. So to do that one, uh, again, um, I'm using the same values except I set the position to be over a little bit and then gave it an angle before I created the body, which is the ramp. And then um, I added a shape to that ramp. So notice that it's the body which is rotated and not the fixture. And then finally, um, this is for the end part, which is that red uh, box right here. It's the target. It needs to be separate so I can tell if it's been hit. So I create a new body for that. Uh, again, give it a position, angle, add a box shape, create a fixture, and we're done. Now, the Bob himself is different, much different than the way we created stuff before. The Blob um, is going to be essentially a bunch of little balls, which are sort of tied together with springs. And I found this really just by testing. Um, but if you change the amount of tension between the springs, then you can make it act more like the sort of blob shape rather than, say, a solid circle or something that just completely falls apart. So you'll find that in a lot of, a lot of the time in box 2D, you're just going to play with values until you get something that feels right. But for the blob, I wanted to um, have essentially a ring of circles. So that means I'm going to go, I need a loop, and I'm going to go from zero to n bodies, which in this case was I wanted the blob made up of 10 little circles. And I could have adjusted this value 
um, to change the effect and determines how many shapes I have on the screen uh, and therefore how performant it's going to be. Uh, calculate an angle, create a new body, um, give it a fixed rotation so the rotation won't change. Calculate its position, so we're just going around in a circle, it's dynamic of course, uh, and I'll actually create the body. Then for the fixture, um, it's going to have multiple fixtures. So for each one, we've got a shape with the uh, body radius, showing how far away it is from the center. Then give it a density of 1 and a group index of negative 2. And what this means, normally you don't care about the group index, but sometimes you want to know that certain things can't interact with other ones. So you can give it an index. Anything in a particular group of stuff, give that index. So I gave it an index of negative 2 so that different circles won't interact with each other. Now I'm going to create the fixture, add the body to the blob itself, and I also have just a list of the blobs that I am storing in an array list called blob bodies, and I'll show you what I use that for next. Now um, blob itself is a constant volume joint depth. And the best way to describe this is that it's something which holds springs, and you can adjust how the springs behave. So in this case, I gave it a frequency of 5 and a damping ratio, meaning how quickly the springs lose their energy to 0.5. And again, these are values that you would just mess with. Now I'll finally create the joint into the world, and it's done. Add the canvas to the scene. Here's our same timer as before. You'll notice I added check before the step and the render, and check is to check if the user has, if the player has actually won the game yet, meaning that they've navigated the blob all the way to the, the game end. So let's get down to actual rendering. Skip reset game. Check is just going to go through the blob bodies and see where they are and if they're close enough to the actual exit position meaning it has to be within five uh, units, which is roughly, um, well, you can see five units is about like that. Now for step, that's the same thing that we did before. For render, um, now what we could do is just clear and do a debug render, but in this case, I want to actually draw stuff myself rather than having Box2D do it for me. So for that, um, we're going to get the canvas context, set the drawing style. In this case, it's gray. I'm going to fill in the background. Now I want to calculate the center. The calc center is right here. And what calc center does is it calculates where the center of the blob is. The blob is really a bunch of little shapes stuck together. So I'm just looping through each of those shapes, getting a total, and then dividing it by the size, calculating the average, so I can determine where is roughly the center of the blob. The reason I do that is because I'm going to use that first to move the canvas around. Now, um, again, if you're familiar with Java 2D, this should seem uh, pretty similar. Canvas has a sense of state before we set the color or the line width and line height. You can also translate, rotate, and scale the current drawing surface. And by saving, it means save the current state, then you can make some changes, and then you can hit restore to go back to the previous state. In Java 2D, we would do this by creating a, a second graphics object and then disposing the graphics when we're done. In Canvas, we just call save and restore. So I'm going to save the state, then translate to the center of the screen, and then scale by 8, and I just chose 8 because that felt right. And then I'm going to translate the center X and center Y. And that is the center where I calculated uh, where the center of the blob was. So essentially the screen is going to pan around following the center of the blob. Uh, and then I'm going to call a bunch of methods for draw borders, draw ramp, draw exit, draw blob. I always find it useful to break up drawing into different chunks by the layers, and then I can work on each chunk separately. Uh, so I'll show this to you in a second. And then if 
Uh, we're currently in the splash screen. I'll draw the splash. If users want, I'll draw one. Now, draw one um, is a little overview screen, and it's just uh, some text saying that you've won. Now, in Canvas, you can set the font, uh, and you're using CSS syntax here. So I set 100 point Georgia. I could also do like 100 point Georgia bold if I wanted to. And Canvas will let you use custom fonts if you want. So um, set the font, set the fill style, fill the text you've won, set the fill style again, stroke the text you've won. And what this does is draws the text twice, once filled with white and once stroked with black. So we get an outline effect. And then I draw the same effect again, this time saying tap to play again. So that's the one screen. And then the splash screen, which you already saw, is the same kind of code. Set some colors, set some font, fill in text. Calculate center, we went through already. Now the blob. Now before we had Box2D do the drawing for us. Now we're going to do it on our own. So that means we have to actually go through the structure of the world, all of the objects that are in the world, including our blob, and draw it ourselves. In the case of the blob, this is a little more complex. I could have just drawn the circles, but I wanted to actually create a path that was around the blob to give it that wobbly look. So what I'm doing is uh, I'm going through my list of blob bodies. I'm going to start at the first one. And then for each one, I'm going to find out um, what the next blob is and then basically draw some lines between the current position of the current blob or circle and the position of the next circle. Calculate some angles and points and draw a Bezier curve between those. Loop through that n times and then close the path, stroke it and fill it. And that's what gives me this shape here. This is actually a giant Bezier curve that had 10 points in it. Now for the eyeballs, um, we just look at the current center, and I actually store the previous center and draw it around that. That way, um, the eyeballs kind of shift a little bit over time. So when I hit the side, you see that the eyeball, the center of the pupils shifted a tiny bit from where the eyeball was. I do that by comparing the current X and the previous X. And again, we're just going to fill in some circles. And as I said before, circles aren't built into Canvas, but you can do that with the arc method here. So begin a path, create an arc, add an X and Y with a particular radius, go from 0 to 360 degrees, and close the path and fill it. Now the borders, this is the actual level. That's really easy to do. Go to the ground, get its fixture list for each fixture. You're going to get the shape inside of it and fill that polygon. Now in Java, we would use iterators, but because this API was built uh, on C originally, um, you have to get, it's essentially this object called uh, fixture, called get fixture list, and it gives you this object which has a get next on it, and you loop through getting next each time until what it returns is null. So that's how we do loops. Uh, the ramp is the same way, but it's a um, specific object, so I'm just uh, calling the, getting the position of the ramp and its angle, all of its fixtures, and drawing them. The exit is, again, the same thing. These are all just calling this utility method I wrote called fill poly, where I get the context, polygon shape, the fill, and the stroke, and it will do the rest for me. And now these are uh, the event handlers. So the event handler, uh, events are actually sort of handled on their own. You don't have to process the event. The event will be called back when it actually happens by GWT. So all you need to do is update some sort of shared variable. In this case, um, if you press the mouse down, I'm going to get the current X and Y of the mouse relative to the center of the screen and use that to set a new gravity. So you're just simply adjusting gravity. Uh, and these are a couple other utility methods from my map. So that's it for the game itself. Um, to hook up to the accelerometer, 
uh, much as we have an event listener for the mouse, we have an event listener for the accelerometer, and this comes from PhoneGap. It's the same API as I showed you last time. In this case, um, we initialize PhoneGap. Once PhoneGap is ready, I'm going to set up some acceleration options with a frequency of 50, meaning it'll be able to call me back up to 50 times a second if the platform supports it. Then call, and here's the magic part, phonegap.getaccelerometer.watchacceleration. So I've now set up a callback. And every time the acceleration changes, it will call me back this on success method. Um, and if we're currently in splash or one, I don't do anything. If not, using the acceleration, I create a new um, gravity, new value for gravity. And in fact, this is, should not be commented out. So why not work on the phone? So that's how we can use acceleration to just turn it into gravity. We just take the current acceleration in X and Y, uh, multiply them each by 10, and I made Y negative, since uh, the accelerometer will, will have Y in a positive direction. I just flip it around and use that as my downward gravity, and that's all there is to it. So I realized that was a great deal of stuff to get through, uh, but I think it gives you a taste of what's possible. This is HTML Canvas. It's running pretty well. Um, in terms of performance, I can get about 30 frames per second on a, a first generation iPad running the newest iOS. Apple added uh, some more hardware acceleration. And I can get close to that on a WebOS tablet on the touchpad. I haven't tried it directly on Android, but I have heard that Ice Cream Sandwich greatly improves their canvas performance as well. So why don't we get into the actual questions now? Hit refresh here. Okay, um, question one. Will I be providing source code? Yes, uh, the source code to this is post it on my website, or if not, it will be shortly. In fact, let me show you my website, joshondesign.com. So I'll be posting uh, source code up here shortly. Um, why do we use a root layout panel? Root layout panel is just a way of getting to what's on the center of the screen. Normally, you would use a root layout panel to nest sub layouts, but we only have one object. So I'm just calling root layout panel get um, for inset. Get without an argument means just get the root of the whole window, and then I'm adding the canvas. Essentially, this lets me set the canvas that's filling the entire screen. Is canvas rendering double buffered, or do you have to implement your own? Yes, it is, well, it's sort of double, double buffered and it's sort of not. Um, the API doesn't really specify, but um, most implementations are going to be double buffered because they're drawing into off-screen memory and then that is sent to the screen by the window manager, which in most modern operating systems is double buffered. So generally you don't have to worry about it. When you would want to do your own double buffering is if you're doing interesting or complex effects like, um, you know, feedback loops or uh, it's something that's just not fast enough to run at 30 frames a second, then you can draw into an off-screen buffer and flip it back and forth. Uh, generally, you don't need to worry about that, though. Um, how about different kind of screen resolution? Will it behave differently on a different screen resolution? That's entirely up to you to implement. So. First, um, you want to fix the size of your screen. This doesn't matter on desktop, but on mobile, um, you're going to want to do that. Uh, I don't think I have a code here, but um, that's what we covered last time, where you set the user scale to none and set it, fix it to one. That way, there's a one pixel of canvas to one actual pixel on the screen. And then from there, you just have to adjust your application based on the size of the screen itself. Now you could do it by scaling the transform. Um, you can, before you pass the context to your drawing code, you could scale it or translate it to match the current screen. I generally recommend against that because it tends to be slower 
to scale everything than to adjust your objects so they scale themselves and actually draw themselves smaller. But for desktop, it probably won't matter, but for mobile, that's something you want to consider. Are there any particle systems available for GWT HTML5? Is Canvas fast enough to support it? Um, I'm not, sh I don't know about for GWT, but there are definitely R particle systems um, for Canvas in general, which can be easily adapted to GWT, and they definitely are fast enough. So let me show you a little prototype. I wrote this in JavaScript, but we can adapt it to Java very easily. So this is just a bunch of rect uh, circles. I think it goes up to like 300 circles, and as they cross the boundaries, it loops back around. And I'm able to get pretty much a rock solid 60 frames a second, and it's taking half of a, barely of a single core, and I've got tons of other things running on my computer. So for modern desktops, it's not really going to be an issue. You can do pretty much anything you want at 60 frames a second really smooth. Mobile is a different issue. And the way you improve performance for particles is to not clear the screen every time, only draw the changes, and be clever about reducing the number of particles you have. Why draw, um, bother drawing the bob yourself instead of using JBox2D? I think I missed a point of this part. So having Box2D draw the objects for you is good for testing. It is a debug drawing, meaning it shows you the borders of everything. It shows you the orientation of your objects, sort of like an x-ray view. And it's good for when you're trying to figure out what's actually going on on the screen. But then when, you, when you're actually making your game, you need to draw all of your characters um, the way they would actually look. So for example, let me turn, um, turn on debug drawing from the blob game, and I'll show you what it looks like. I'm just going to draw again with the shapes and the joints. While that's compiling, do we have any other questions? I think that was the last one I had listed. Okay. Josh, were you able to look in that QA tab? That's on the presenter yeah, console. You got them? Okay. Yeah, I went through, we went through seven of them. That was fast. Perfect. <laughs> Folks, again, if you have questions for Josh, send those in while we still have him with us. Um, at this time, there are no additional questions. So this is what it looks like with the bug drawing turned on. So sort of like an x-ray view. I can see what the blob is actually doing. You can see it's actually a bunch of circles attached by springs. Uh, the scaling is not correct. It's the default scaling instead of what I applied. And of course, the level doesn't look right. Um, you know, it's missing stuff. It's zoomed in, so it appears to be going slower than it really is. And it's not panning around the way it would. But it's a good way of just uh, getting something up on the screen quickly and seeing what the physics actually looks like. Okay, um, I think we finished up a little bit early, so um, if there's any more questions, we have time. If not, I thank you very much.